afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for Rethinking Brazilian Development, the Political Economy of Democratic Brazil. I'm Anya Prusa. I'm the Slater Family Fellow and Senior Associate at our Brazil Institute. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you today for what is going to be a very interesting discussion and one that I think has gained increasing relevance given the news of the last couple of days um, in Brazil. As many of you watching know, Brazilian economic performance over the last three decades has lagged behind other upper middle income countries on a number of indicators um, from savings, productivity, uh, per capita growth, inequality, and policymakers have struggled um, to change the course of development in Brazil. In his new book, uh, Decadent Developmentalism, The Political Economy of Democratic Brazil, Former Wilson Center fellow Matthew Taylor, who's with us today, examines the political and institutional context behind some of these challenges. You know, some of the reasons why um, Brazil has not been able to develop either a more capable developmentalist state or a less interventionist market alternative. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers today so that we can actually get to the discussion. Um, first, we're going to hear from Matthew Taylor, um, who it's his book that we are here to discuss today. He was a, a Wilson Center fellow um, when he was first working on this book, and we're incredibly pleased to have him back with us today. Uh, Matthew is an associate professor at the School of International Service at American University um, and an expert on Brazilian political economy, politics, um, and we've featured some of his work on corruption as well. Our next speaker is going to be Leslie Elliott Armijo. Uh, she holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and is an adjunct professor at the School for International Studies at Simon Fraser University with expertise in international relations and financial development of large emerging powers, uh, including in Latin America. Our third speaker is Sarah Maslin. She's the Sao Paulo Bureau Chief and a former Central America contributor for The Economist. And we're very pleased to have her join us to give a little bit of insight into what's happening in Brazil right now. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Taylor um, to discuss his book and present on, on some of the themes and arguments that he makes. Great. Well, I'm just going to find a way to share my screen here. I hope you can see it now. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the introduction, Anya. Uh, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to you, uh, to your colleague, distinguished senior fellow, Paulo Sotero, uh, to all of the staff of the Brazil Institute, uh, and of course, uh, of the Wilson Center, who uh, welcomed me when this was just getting started and then have been extremely patient. It's been uh, an uncountable number of years since I started the project. So I appreciate your patience, but also your support over the years. Um, I'm also, of course, really grateful that uh, we could be joined by uh, Leslie and Sarah, who are experts uh, on the themes that are discussed in the book and, and know Brazil well. And so I look forward to learning from both of them in, in the discussion. As you can tell from the title, this is a book about Brazilian political economy since 1985 and the return to democracy. The motivating question, as Anya pointed out, is uh, that the, tr to try to understand why the country has not uh, managed to alter its governing economic paradigm, despite some fairly lackluster economic indicators. And um, just to give you a sense of this, if I'm able to move forward, there we go. Um, per capita income growth is one indicator. And if we look at how Brazil has done by comparison to many important peer countries, uh, Brazil has been steadily losing ground, as you can see here. So Brazil would be the equivalent of one on this graph, and you can see that it has lost ground by comparison to um, India, China, to some of its Latin American peers, to the upper middle income countries, uh, and even uh, by comparison to OECD members. And this is somewhat perplexing on several levels. The first reason it's perplexing um, is that there are no shortage of prescriptions for how Brazil could do better. Uh, these prescriptions also remain remarkably constant over time. In the book, I actually compare uh, 
some of the prescriptions from the multilateral banks in Washington in the 1980s with um, the prescriptions in the 2010s. And the list is not all that different. A second reason why this is perplexing is that there are at least two alternative paths that Brazil could have followed. Um, and the first would be to deepen the developmental state to make it a more effective developmental state so as to make the developmentalist project uh, more, more effective, following the example for, uh, say, of, of South Korea. The other alternative would be to adopt a market-oriented alternative, what is sometimes uh, called in Latin America the neoliberal path. The third reason it's somewhat perplexing is because Brazil has been um, extraordinarily active, and one might say even hyperactive in reform. A slew of reforms that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen have been implemented, uh, but they don't seem to have added up to a paradigm shift. Incredibly, three decades after the democratic constitution was approved, the Bolsonaro economic reform agenda looks uh, remarkably uh, similar to that of his predecessors, emphasizing among other things, pension reform, tax reform, civil service reform, trade opening. And so what we find is that the neoliberal reforms that have been implemented in the 1990s and, and increasingly, I think, today, haven't fully dismantled the developmental state. And that has enabled uh, the developmental state apparatus to continue to be used by policymakers of all ideological stripes. So I refer to this policy equilibrium as decadent developmentalism, the title of the book. And the, the term developmentalism has been uh, defined by Ricardo Bielschowski, one of the leading uh, academics working in this area, as the ideology of overcoming underdevelopment through capitalist industrialization, planned and supported by the state. Developmentalism then is a set of ideas, it's a theory, it's an array of policies. And as uh, Leslie's work has shown, uh, developmentalism has changed over time, but at least since President Kohler, we can argue that Brazil has been marked by a quote unquote new developmentalism. Uh, all governments have relied uh, on a consensus on economic policies that we can label the new developmentalism. The second term here, though, is decadent, and the dictionary definition is luxuriously self-indulgent. Uh, this is, um, you know, a reference to the way in which the developmentalist state works. And the argument that I want you to take away is that the failure of the political system has failed to drive the developmental state in a way that would effectively drive private capital uh, and insulate policy enable the accumulation of capital and steer it in directions that are positive uh, for the aggregate economy. So the first argument is that the Brazilian developmental state under democracy has lost, if it ever had them, the characteristics that are needed to achieve this very difficult political balancing act. Under democracy, the control, the power that the state has to control uh, firms and pri the private sector has not been instituted in part because of the president's reliance on a broad coalition for political support, but also because partly in consequence of this, oversight agencies are not as strong as they would need to be in order to enforce the boundaries between states, the state and firms. Um, the problem, in other words, is not just technical understanding. It's not just getting the prescriptions right. It's understanding how politics affects the implementation of those policies. So this will be the, the only uh, academic jargon laden slide. Uh, bear with me, please. And I know Leslie is chuckling there because uh, we were discussing all the jargon. But um, the, the concept here uh, that's at the heart of the book is the notion of varieties of capitalism. And uh, the notion that there are different configurations of institutions that make capitalism, let's say in Germany, very different than it is in the Anglo-Saxon countries, or for that matter, in Latin America or Asia. And uh, what I want to argue is that the, the phenomena that I've just described to you, the failure to refurbish the developmental state, 
the failure to reach a new market-oriented paradigm and the hyperactivity of reform all have this same core origin, and that is the complementarity between the five domains that are shown on your screen. One of the problems of social science is that we often study these institutions in isolation. So we focus on the bureaucracy or Congress or political parties or firms. Uh, and that leads us to miss the way in which they, these domains, these institutional domains actually drive towards a common institutional equilibrium. So I'm gonna quickly run through these five domains um, and I'm gonna have to hit only the high points but hopefully that leaves us plenty to discuss in the Q&A. So in the macroeconomic domain, uh, I think the, the first point is simply that there's a very strong fiscal imperative. The 1988 constitution uh, put in place a number of spending commitments. The return to democracy uh, increased redistributive pressure. The trauma of hyperinflation uh, has contributed to this fiscal imperative and the need to attract and maintain foreign investment also contributes here. And so the dirty secret of Brazil's otherwise very strong president is shown on the left-hand side of your screen. If you look at the budget, the item that's listed there as Custeo e Investimento is the, really the only part of the budget that is available for discretionary spending by the executive. And uh, within this relatively limited space, fiscal space, the executive branch uh, also has uh, expenses that you wouldn't think would be here, like social policies such as Bolsa Familia are in here. And what this means is that there's very little money left over uh, for uh, investment. And so growth, because of low public sector investment, growth, as uh, Samuel Pessoa has shown, is essentially residual. That is, it's what's left over at the end of the day after social policy. Uh, and this generates incentives towards opaque social spend, uh, excuse me, opaque fiscal spending uh, using policy tools that are available through the developmental state apparatus, but they don't necessarily show up uh, in the fiscal bottom line. Uh, this could be industrial policies, it could be credit and lending, uh, tax credits cross-shareholding, uh, regulatory assistance, selective protections, things like this that are made available by the developmental state, but that don't show up readily in the fiscal accounts. And it also leads to a second uh, phenomenon, which is the, the core reliance on foreign investment to make up for the shortfall in domestic public investment. Uh, and this leads to an irony in a developmentally oriented state, which is um, that foreign firms are attracted to Brazil and then treated like, essentially like uh, domestic firms within national borders. In other words, competing with domestic firms that ideally developmentalist policies would be helping to move up the uh, innovation and productivity frontier. The second domain here is microeconomic, and I don't have a lot of time to go through this except to say that I rely heavily on Ben Ross Schneider's model of a variety of capitalism in Latin America that he calls the hierarchical market economy. Uh, Brazil shares many of the characteristics of the hierarchical market economy that Schneider points to. And you can see it most clearly on this graph, uh, the bar chart on the right, essentially from steelworks and metallurgy to the right of this chart, uh, all of these sectors are sectors in which Brazilian firms dominate. And as Schneider's model would suggest, these are, these are areas uh, that are low complexity, often commodity producing, labor intensive, but not really skills intensive, with one exception, which is the financial sector. The implication of this is really important, is really significant though, because it means that there's very little incentive for Brazilian firms to actually come together for collective action that would lead to upgrading reforms. And so you have this firm segmentation that leads to a segmentation of the labor market, skills versus unskilled uh, labor, uh, and then also leads to uh, I would say lackluster participation by domestic firms in efforts that would reform the educational system, 
uh, regulate labor markets and so forth. Uh, and this tends to contribute to uh, fairly regressive policies and I would argue low productivity. Uh, Brazil fits Schneider's model, but we do see a couple of unique things. One is there's less diversification across sectors in part because of the availability of state-run finance from big state-owned banks and the National Development Bank. There's also fairly um, strong state involvement through developmental institutions and um, uh, a, a continued reliance on the state, despite, as Musacchio and Lazzarini have shown, despite the privatization of literally hundreds of billions of dollars of firms uh, over the past 35 years, the state maintains an important role in the economy, uh, controlling about 100 state-owned enterprises still as a majority shareholder, but then also uh, through network capitalism, that is maintaining minority stakes that it can use to guide uh, these firms, the private, ostensibly private sector firms. That leads me to the issue of the macro politics. And uh, obviously, if the state seeks to influence firms, firms will also seek to influence the state. The um, you can see here a graph of Congress. This is actually from 2010. It doesn't look very different um, today. But what you can see here is just the enormous fragmentation of the political system. And this opens up this fragmentation both within the legislative branch and then the corresponding fragmentation in the federal government, the executive branch, opens up a number of venues that can be used by interest groups and by firms to influence policy. And the temptation here is not really to engage in collective action, but instead to engage in what I call defensive parochialism, that is defending their interests. Uh, to govern, the president needs to pull together a coalition. Oftentimes that coalition is 70, 75% of Congress. Uh, and the president does have a fairly extensive role of uh, a, a, a series of tools that they can use uh, to, to govern. And so governability has occurred. But um, in order to achieve almost anything, there is also the informal exchange of coalition goods. This can include corruption, but it need not be solely corruption. And what we see is that um, there are other coalition goods which are used that are completely licit and completely acceptable in the political system, appointments, credit, um, you know, transfers to particular states or municipalities. But one of the consequences of the coalition formation, uh, the process of coalition formation, is that there's relatively weak accountability across the branches. The two branches, the executive and the legislative branches are overlapping uh, and they have very little incentive to actually um, oversee each other. Oversight bodies uh, at their peak are often controlled by nominees of the coalition. And so even oversight bodies that would be outside of um, executive and legislative coalitions are in fact, um, have difficulty in overseeing uh, the, the activities of the developmental state and the activity of firms. And so this is a pattern of political interaction that leads to a suboptimal inefficient equilibrium. It drives up the cost of politics. It dilutes the coherence of policy initiatives. It requires costly side payments, and yet it sticks around. It remains, uh, it survives because it provides key interest groups with, um, survive, with defense against policy change. It provides incumbents with um, the tools for political survival. It provides executives with support in a highly fragmented political system. And it provides incumbent firms with tools that they can use uh, to outcompete potential rivals. It leads, however, to the fourth domain here, which is the domain uh, of control. And um, the, the central starting point for understanding control is that in a developmental state, as in a, a more market-oriented state, there, needs, there, there are often rents that are used by the state to create incentives for firms to do the things that government would like firms to do. Uh, and exchange, in exchange for those rents, uh, 
uh, there's the government expects some sort of reciprocity. And sometimes the reciprocity, the reciprocal aims are clearly, um, they're made explicit, uh, but oftentimes they're not. And in, in the Brazilian case, what we find is that even when they're made explicit, they're oftentimes not enforced. So the rents that are provided in this system are enormous. And I look at four different cases uh, to, to demonstrate this, all cases of industrial policy, the Plano Brasil Maior uh, by uh, the Rousseff administration, but also automotive policy under a variety of presidents, including Cardozo and Temer, who were uh, more liberal uh, in, in nature, the uh, free trade zone of Manaus, which has been in place for six decades, uh, and the ethanol programs that have been around since the 1970s. And what we find uh, is that huge rents are offered to firms. Uh, in the two, 2010s, tax breaks and credit subsidies often reach 6% of GDP. In some years, uh, loans from state-owned banks reached 11% of GDP. And then there were less quantifiable market protections um, and investments by state-controlled entities. Uh, however, because of the political um, exchanges that I described in the previous slide and that are described in the book, there's no way to get reciprocity. Control has been very lackluster, uh, and the consequence is a lack of strategic direction, a lack of strategic coordination, multiple access points that undermine regulatory autonomy, uh, and little evaluation of the costs and benefits of policy, either proactively or retroactively. So um, this all dilutes uh, effective control. Finally, uh, I won't have a lot of time to go through this, but I, I know many of you are probably saying, well, but a lot has changed in Brazil. And how do you explain that? And so if um, I think it's important to make the point that equilibrium does not mean that change cannot happen. Uh, and in fact, what we do see is perhaps the most common form of change comes out of the autonomous bureaucracy. And so many of the most important changes in democratic Brazil have been the consequence of the autonomy of the federal bureaucracy. This is a very capable civil service, partly because it's needed by a developmental state. Um, and the fact that there are many principles, that is many potential political masters means that in essence, there is no political master. And so um, the, the, the bureaucracy has been uh, able to both generate new ideas, uh, in many cases, push them forward, and in, in some cases, uh, engage in incremental long-term processes of reform. And we saw this with fiscal reorganization in the 1980s and early 1990s. We saw it with anti-corruption reform uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. We see this with social policy as well. And I, I skipped over, of course, the healthcare system uh, is another case. So I described the last three there in, in the book. So let me just wrap up now by saying Many people thought that after the crises of the 2010s, uh, with the election of right-wing president, uh, a president who chose as his super minister, the economics minister, uh, Paulo Guedes, who is a Chicago PhD, who famously complained not just about Dilma Rousseff's reforms, but also about Fernando Henrique's you know, timid reforms, that change was on the way. And I think the question that we'll be discussing a lot, um, I hope uh, in the coming um, moments, is whether this in fact has come to pass, whether the change that was uh, promised and believed to be imminent with Bolsonaro and Guedes at the helm has in fact come to pass. And I don't have a lot of time, to, I don't have any time really, but just to, to finish up, to sort of spark the conversation, let me suggest to you that I still see the equilibrium at work here. That is, these um, five different domains are once again driving us uh, back to an equilibrium that is very similar to what we've seen in the past. So one great example is that Geddes went to the Zona Franca de Manaus, the free trade zone in Manaus, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, you guys, you guys are messing us up. You expect me to put forward money so that you can mess up the economy. And within a few months, he was back 
at the Zona Franca de Manaus, having signed millions of dollars for the Zona Franca. And uh, he, he said, we are not going to, and I'm quoting, we are not going to target the essence and the economic heart of Brazilian regions. A second area in which uh, we've seen this equilibrium reassert itself is with regulatory agencies. And Geddes came into office and he said, the regulatory agencies that were created under the Cardozo reforms have, have essentially lost their autonomy. And he began to put into place reforms of the regulatory agencies, at which point Bolsonaro reacted publicly saying, what, do you want me to become the queen of England? Uh, referring simply to her ceremonial, purely ceremonial duties. So uh, kind of an interesting example of a defense from the president of the developmental or, or the developmental attributes of these regulatory agencies. And then finally, the final example I'll give is that Bolsonaro came into office bringing an entirely new class of politicians. Uh, when Bolsonaro was elected, he of course was a backbencher uh, for 30 years, but when he was elected, 243 out of the 513 members of, of the lower house of Congress were new to Congress. They were entirely new incumbents. Bolsonaro also came into office and he said, I will not play this coalitional game. And within a year, he was uh, distributing sub-ministerial appointments that controlled more than 75 billion reais to a number of the parties uh, represented both by old and new uh, politicians, but the parties that are known as the Centrão, parties that are ideologically indistinguishable from each other and uh, have played at this coalitional game for 35 years. So. I guess I'll conclude just by saying, uh, in addition to thank you uh, for letting me uh, talk to you about the book a little bit, that I think the book makes the point that we really can't understand economic policy over the past 35 years in Brazil without reference to the interlocking aspects, the institutional complementarities between the economic system and political institutions, and in particular, the control that the state is able and willing to exercise over economic policy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthew. There's a lot of food for thought in your comments and I look forward to uh, discussing that, especially as we get to the Q&A. A reminder to those of you who are watching, um, if you do have questions for Matthew or for our other two panelists, you can email us at brazil at wilsoncenter.org or send them uh, via Twitter at Brazil Inst. Um, we're gonna turn next to Leslie Elliott Armijo. Uh, please go ahead, Leslie. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Matthew. It was interesting to hear your, um, your, your own summary of your book. Um, um, great slides. <laughs> so I asked myself three questions, um, which I'm gonna try to answer. First question, is the book worth reading? Uh, two, does the model make sense on its own terms? And three, um, what would be a larger critique of the project from a larger comparative political economy perspective? In other words, that's where you say, well, you did what you did well, but what about this other thing that you didn't do? All right. Um, so is the book worth reading? Yes, I'm enthused. Um, two audiences. One would be people who care about Brazil, who know Brazil, who, who govern Brazil, who work in Brazil. Um, I would note uh, that Matthew has read, it seems to me, almost everything written about Brazilian political economy in the last 30 years, uh, both in English and in Portuguese. In fact, um, I found myself reading on my screen, right, my small laptop screen, uh, I had two copies of the book open. One I was rereading. I had read it once last year about August or September, rereading it over the last couple of days. But I had to have another copy open because I wanted to read every footnote. They're great footnotes. They're all little asides, little anecdotes, little random thoughts. Man, I don't know how you got your publisher to let you keep them, but they're wonderful. And of course, the references. So. Um, you know, if you're a Brazilophile, you will like it. It's very interesting. It's got lots of detail. Um, 
let me talk about the academic uh, kind of put my academic hat on. Um, why is it useful there? Okay, first of all, it is a good example of what we could call old fashioned comparative political economy. That is, Matt is not a variable researcher. Uh, he's, as he says, a case study researcher. But more than that, I mean, the way he thinks about case studies, I think is really valuable. Uh, it's kind of a combination of deductive logic and frankly, inductive, sitting around saying, okay, there's a system here. I don't quite know how it works. You know, let me put my <laughs> intuition out there. Mm, maybe I'll look over here. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, he could have been a little bit more explicit about his research design. Not that I don't like it, but I think it's good to defend this kind of research. You can't understand a system by just adding up the pieces. The whole is more than the sum of the pieces. So I appreciate that. Uh, for those who are um, thinking about academic comparative political science, you will find Brazil uh, quickly explicated in you know, a chapter or half a chapter or 10 pages from the following viewpoints. Uh, one, um, the politics of macroeconomic policy. Uh, great history of the democratic transition to about 2018, uh, highlighted by the control of inflation. Uh, so various failed stabilization plans and then the successful Real plan and efforts to get the fiscal budget under control or the, the government budget under control. Uh, this is the uh, fiscal responsibility law of 2000, which of course has all kinds of unintended consequences that Matt lays out very nicely. Uh, second um, kind of literature that he, that he references and tells you how Brazil works within that literature, as he notes, is the varieties of capitalism literature, AKA the business government relations or business government labor relations. He does a good job telling you how Brazil fits in that as he mentioned in his summary. He says, well, Brazil is a hierarchical market economy but it's different than most of Latin America. Very interesting. Uh, third, executive legislative relations. This is his coalitional presidentialism piece Again, he cited everybody, nice summary, lots of interesting details. Uh, fourth, of course, developmental state literature, uh, which leads into the whole question considered by both working economists in the international financial institutions and in middle income countries, you know, how, how do we get rich? How do we become uh, higher income per capita? Or maybe we're gonna define this as as uh, being more industrialized or even post-industrial, digital, whatever. Um, Matt is very good and very honest, I think, about this. He says, well, look, what's the essence of the developmental state? It's providing rents. It's providing economic, the state provides economic rents to autonomous actors, both private firms and sometimes others, state firms, people in the bureaucracy, to get them to cohere around some, some development goal, uh, some form, some understanding of what we could call strategic comparative advantage, as opposed to just accepting what you can do or sell or make right now. Um, plus uh, the need for an autonomous bureaucracy to implement that. Uh, and a fifth major literature is of course, the literature on corruption particularly political corruption. And here I will again note that he's, he's got great detail, best summaries of Lava Jato. I know that's uh, something that, that Matt's been working on for a while, uh, but it uh, sounds like he read all 100 depositions of uh, uh, Paulo Roberto Costa uh, and referenced them and so on. Okay. Um, so, it's, it's useful, I think, to have at least some of us as scholars looking at all these different literatures and putting them together and saying, how do they relate? If this literature says this and this says this, are they contradictory? How do they work? And how am I doing on time? Anybody wanna give me a, a five or 10? I can't 
You have like four minutes left. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Um, all right. Um, so the second question then, does the model make sense in its own terms? So here I'm gonna be academic for a minute. Okay, five reinforcing dimensions, um, the developmental state, sort of an ethos, a goal, a set of institutions, uh, both formal institutions and kind of procedures and norms. Uh, second component of this five is business, government, labor relations, the developmental hierarchical market economy, also known as the macro microeconomic uh, lens, coalitional presidentialism, which in his slide he's called uh, macro political control mechanisms. This is the one I find, I found the hardest. This is kind of a catch all. <laughs> this is how the developmental state gets carried through. Uh, and five, autonomous bureaucracy. Now, as I was reading this, like I said, this is too confusing, five is too much. I kept trying to keep them straight. I mean, I, I can do it, but if you wanna be a success, you need to get it simpler. And I noted that in the conclusion, Matt said, well, maybe two are the most important. I agree, two are the most important, developmental state and coalitional presidentialism. Um, so, I think those are the those are the two core variables or the two core institutions, excuse me, uh, and you could probably uh, subsume the others. Is the model new? Well, he starts out at one point in the intro saying, "Is this different than, um, say, the other uh, comparative political economy of uh, emerging?" markets or middle-income countries books written by people like Atul Kohli or uh, Peter Evans when he's doing his comparative uh, second sort of stage after being just Brazil focused. And they all kind of say, well, Brazil is somewhere in between a mess and a successful developmental state like Korea, Brazil, maybe also India, but they're different. Is what he is saying different? Well, no, in a way it's not, but does it give us value added? Yes, because he is in fact making a really clear argument that this is a reinforcing system. You try to get away and then you go back to the mean because, and he doesn't say what the because is. I mean, logically it's, well, you need a big bang or something, but I'm not sure he wants to go there. But anyway, he does give you additional, um, but it's not so, so different. Um, also, I wondered, is this really democratic Brazil or is this just Brazil ever since at least the second world war? Um, and again, I'm not so sure that, that all of this is unique to post 1985 Brazil. Uh, certainly if you look at um, the more qualitative sorts of economists, uh, Werner Bayer, William Tyler, uh, Peter Evans, when he's writing about the economy, people like that who were writing about the 60s and 70s, uh, Milan and Bonelli, uh, some of the IPEA studies of industrial policy, <laughs> they're showing the same thing. You've got one incentive here and it's not working. So you put on another one that goes to correct it. And, you know, uh, and then again, the coalitional presidentialism, as you point out, Matt goes back to the um, uh, post-war democracy. So that, well, that's fine, but, um, and, and, perfectly legitimate, but it's worth saying. So, okay. Um, all right. Critique from larger political economy perspectives. Look, here's my main critique. Uh, or no, I have three main critiques. One is a lot of the analysis is kind of soft, rational choice. You know, let's look at this actor and what are their incentives and see why they behave in such and such a way because of the incentives. Except when you talk about, you flip and the state, you know, the state needs control mechanism. Well, who's the state? <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know, is it the president? Is it the planning minister? Is it the, the bureaucracy? Um, somehow we just throw all of that, let's look at incentive stuff out the window. 
Um, so I would push you on that in your next iteration. Two, um, the developmental state literature in general assumes that there is a right path out there, that there is a way if you can just kind of get the right experts in the room and implement their policies, you can figure out how to jump from middle income status to your strategic comparative advantage and stop being an agro exporter or whatever it is you think you need to do. Maybe, I don't know, but I don't think the jury's in on that one. Um, I mean, we political scientists tend to take that as a given. I think economists are actually more, more skeptical. And finally, look, um, again, this is a, this is a critique uh, based on how we think about the developmental state and the, the whole concept. You are assuming in most of the book uh, that the develop, as I said, the developmental state kind of has some expertise, but remember, there are some kinds of decisions that are amenable to expertise and there are other kinds of decisions that are not, that require political balancing of different values and things. And, and in all the discussions about control uh, mechanisms, um, I think that gets lost. So, you know, if you wanna add another literature, you might think about the literature on policy decision-making that distinguishes between how do you build a bridge and what kind of roads, what kind of infrastructure are you going to allow to be built in the Amazon and who gets to decide? Um, okay, I think actually I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. A uh, number of questions in there, Matthew, if you wanted to respond once we get to the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Sarah next um, to, to talk a little bit more on the economic side. Hi everyone, it's um, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much for having me and I've already learned a lot. Um, so my task here is to talk about how this book relates to events in Brazil. Um, and so I'll try to talk about economics and politics and then at the end, get a little bit to the question of, of democracy and um, the, the environment. Um, but first, as a prologue, I wanted to start in May 2018, which was my first week in Brazil and also happened to be the truckers strike. Um, and so this was right at the beginning, I kind of consider it the, the front bookend of the campaign. And we saw Bolsonaro at his most true self. I think he was taking photos with the truck drivers, some of whom had banners calling for a return to military rule. And he was very sympathetic to their demands of price controls on fuel, which had motivated this massive country stopping protest in the first place. Um, and, and I think that this moment tells us something about Bolsonaro and also about Brazil. Uh, so the public eventually got sick of the protests, uh, which lasted for, I think, 10 days and stopped supply chains and uh, drove the markets crazy. But at first, it really had sweeping support. I think 87% of people at one point told pollsters that they supported these truck drivers. And to this day, most Brazilians say they don't want to see Petrobras, the oil firm, privatized, even as the demand for a shakeup in politics and the corruption scandals of, of the past five or six years um, got Bolsonaro elected in the first place. And so at the time, the president was um, Mikel Temer, who had managed to pack in quite a few liberal economic reforms in, in his short time in office. And he understood that the independence of Petrobras was the only hope to recover from the Lava Jato corruption scandal and the interventions during the president of Dilma Rousseff. And, and even then, I think it's telling that he intervened to get rid of the, um, the head of Petrobras at the time and to subsidize fuel, pri fuel prices. Um, although at the end, it was, it was the government, not the company that paid the bill. So um, as you can probably expect, uh, fast forward to last week, we saw a similar situation of rising oil prices, 
uh, the falling Real. Uh, Bolsonaro got irritated at the current head of Petrobras, who, who basically said the truckers' demands were not his problem, and he fired him. He and we saw again markets react swiftly. Petrobras lost a quarter of its uh, of its market value, and the whole stock market dropped about five percent. And it has recovered some since. But um, I think I mean one thing that's important is as much as the fact that he intervened is is the way he did it. He did it on Facebook. He mocked the um, the president of of Petrobras for working from home during the pandemic, he threatened to intervene in other state firms. So what does this say? Um, I think on first read, this is you know, an inflection point. Uh, the mask is off of this government. Uh, developmentalist Bolsonaro has prevailed over his neoliberal economy minister, Paulo Guedes. And, uh, and you know, we'll see more and more of this kind of meddling as the election approaches. That's you know, the way that this has, episode has, has been covered in a lot of places. And I, I think that that's not necessarily wrong, but um, it needs a bit more nuance. And I think that, um, that this book actually will really help us to understand. So for, I think the first point that I would make is that he's not the first president to intervene in Petrobras since it was founded Governments have used it and other state firms for their political and economic agendas, whether that is controlling inflation, boosting industry, or buying votes. Somebody posted on Twitter, I forget who it was, but that throughout the history of Petrobras, the average time that a president lasted is just 18 months. So Fernando Enrique Cardozo intervened, Lula intervened, Dilma intervened. The second point, I think, is that this tension within uh, in the Bolsonaro government between his more developmentalist uh, instincts and, and those of, of many of his advisors, and then the kind of neoliberal uh, faction in the economy ministry, that's always been there. And over the past two years, the, the markets have kind of yo-yoed depending on, on which of these faction is, is seeming to prevail in a given moment. Um, and third, I think that there's, you know, there's moments where we've seen more optimism. Um, we're never perhaps expecting a total uh, market friendly U-turn, uh, rather the kind of incremental change that, that this book describes. And, and that was the hope, perhaps with the political shakeup of Bolsonaro, with the kind of public momentum for change, and really with the dire fiscal situation, that they could scrape by some reforms. And they did with, with the pensions reform. Um, and you know, now we've got a little less than two years left in office and, and reforms kind of become less likely as the election approaches, but it, but it is still possible that they'll be able to get some very watered down versions of, of tax reform and public sector reform. So I think this kind of episode over the past week really shows the importance of seeing how uh, how these institutions that, that Matthew's book describes work together and how unrealistic it kind of always, always was to think that this government would usher in a kind of dramatic change while a lot of the other institutions have stayed the same, uh, especially the political system, which is the second kind of main point I wanted to highlight um, of this current moment. We've seen recently the, the victory of politicians from the Central. Uh, the opportunistic center in both municipal elections last year and in the election of the Senate and lower house presidents earlier this month. And that has come sort of hand in hand with the Bolsonaro administration's more open dealing with these parties in the traditional way uh, to do politics, that is pork and patronage. And so this news and this kind of shift in the, in the political realm has led to a debate here about whether this might sort of somewhat ironically improve the chances of economic reforms, because at least one institution, the kind of political machine is running more smoothly, or whether reforms are now doomed because the motor of these parties is rent seeking, which will only increase as the election approaches. Um, I just wanted to say I really liked Matthew's use of the term hyperactive paralysis to describe the sense that despite you know hundreds of politicians and, and thousands of bureaucrats and, and, and a really kind of robust um, political system in Brazil, it, it does seem that you know very little gets done sometimes. And he suggested a kind of revision of that term 
um, hyperactive incrementalism to take into the account the fact that you know sometimes re reforms do manage to to sneak through over time um, you know through how these institutions all kind of work together uh, i find that this term hyperactive paralysis and also incrementalism really fits what it feels like to be a journalist in brazil where uh, you really don't have a moment to breathe it's one story after the next and then sometimes you you know you find yourself having beers a boteco with friends and, and asking you know what really has happened has anything really happened um and i also think it probably fits what it feels like to be a brazilian especially now that social media has has pulled the curtain back at least a little bit on what happens in Brasilia and, and how it happens. Um, I mean, I'm thinking a lot lately about how this conversation about how to keep some version of, of what's called the auxilio emergencial or stipends to help um, informal workers and poor people in Brazil. This conversation started months ago and even as poverty has shot up amid a new wave of COVID-19, it's only this week that they might finally um, get a vote on it. And it's looking pretty likely that the spending, uh, which is really necessary, may happen without the kind of savings and fiscal reforms that are supposed to come with it, um, which you know could only exacerbate the inflation that's been creeping up and hurts the poor the most. And so I guess the final thing that I wanted to say is, while you know, of course, this book is is focused on a political economy, it would be I think irresponsible for me as a journalist not to mention quickly two other big topics that. Um, that I think this book really has helped me to understand um, democracy and, and the environment. And the question of, of whether this kind of apparent shift in recent months to a more pliant Congress on the one hand and the election coming up on the other uh, caused reasons to worry about the strength and quality of, of Brazilian democracy. Um, I mean, we've seen over the past two years how, how what Matthew calls veto players, so the different kind of people who have the ability in the legislature and, um, and the judiciary to, to strike things down have been able, for the most part, to block Bolsonaro's most radical proposals, like, for example, putting the environment ministry in, into the agriculture ministry or legalizing mining on indigenous reserves. But at the same time as this kind of institutional resilience, we've seen how these same institutions have ultimately put a damper on some of the progress, like the lasting or that is uh, like the anti-corruption initiatives, which now look like they may not be as lasting as people hoped. Um, the Lava Jato task force was wound down last month, but it really started to die years ago when the investigation started expanding from the left-wing PT to other parties. So it was relatively easy for Bolsonaro to use his executive power and, and influence on certain judicial institutions to shield his son from investigation. And so that kind of shows us how this, this equilibrium that the book describes can be both useful in you know, holding back someone with authoritarian instincts like Bolsonaro and also detrimental in kind of keeping Brazil stuck in the structural reforms that could you know, block those things in the long run. Um, and, and I guess the big question kind of both you know, from the beginning of the whole Bolsonaro era is how seriously we should take the risk of a, of a rupture in Brazil's democracy. And so I think that um, you know, that's a conversation we can have, but I think equally important is looking at the kind of incremental erosion. Um, and nowhere is this clearer than with the environment. And, and if you look at kind of these complementary institutions that, that, uh, that Matthew focuses on, you can see how they have all really been involved in the dismantling of, of environmental enforcement from a strong executive who has no interest in keeping trees standing in the Amazon to a weakened bureaucracy because of kind of budget being slashed and, and important uh, organizations like Obama and ICMBO having their authority taken away. And, and finally, the politicians who have you know, little incentive to see uh, kind of a crackdown on, on illicit activities in the Amazon and deforestation and plenty of incentive to benefit from the commodities boom that has driven the rise in deforestation and the kind of economic interests that surround it. Um, so thanks very much, I think that's it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Matthew, I know there were a number of points in there. Do you want to respond to some of them before we turn to questions from our audience? We've gotten a, a couple of good ones from the folks who are watching. I would love to hear from the audience. Uh, I, I mean, I have nothing to say, but thank you. Uh, I think these are all excellent, excellent points and, and 
in some ways draw out what I was trying to say better than I did, and then uh, also raise concerns. Uh, and you know, I guess the 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 question that that bothered me most from from Leslie, if you'll allow me, is where wither democracy, right? And so uh, it's it's kind of interesting that Sarah actually, um, you know, talked about democracy. And I guess the the you know I, I did ultimately have to downplay democracy to get to some of the economic you know to because of the focus of the book. Uh, but I would say that you know the electoral system um, that contributes to coalitional presidentialism is core to understanding almost all of the rest of the institutional complementarities that are here. And I think that's sort of what Sarah was saying. Uh, but you're right, Leslie, that I don't address democracy in this, um, you know, sort of positive norm from a positive normative perspective that's focused on democratic theory per se, but rather just as a political system. And, um, you know, I think that I've been I've been one, wondering as I was rereading the book in preparation for today, whether this is a system that, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm advocating a change away from democracy. Um, democracy is hugely important, but I, I do think that the kind of political reforms that are needed to make whatever economic policy that Brazilians decide is the correct, you know, policy set to make that work um that's got to come about democratically and i so you know I, democracy is is central to the argument even though it's not uh the, you know the normative questions about democracy are not um my my focus here uh and then sarah you know thank you for and, and leslie i'll just say i mean I, I we've had a dialogue going on now since i first met you at the puki rio um maybe you know 20 years ago and um, learned a lot from you then and, and uh, continue to learn from both your work and, and from our discussions over time. And so I take to heart all of your critiques and only wish that I had gotten you as a, one of my reviewers. My reviewers, anonymous reviewers were great, but uh, you've raised new things for me to think about perhaps in the next project. But uh, Sarah, uh, I, you know, I think that the you you raised a very important point, um, and I'm glad you you bring it out, which is the extent to which incrementalism is both positive and negative. Uh, it pre prevents Brazil from going through some of the trauma, for example, that Argentina has been through, or even more extreme, what Venezuela has been through. Uh, on the other hand, as you as you very um, you know you well pointed out. Uh, it does put a damper on certain positive reform efforts. And I think you talked about anti-corruption just, uh, you know, yesterday, uh, the president changed the the improbity, what do you call that? I don't even know how you translate it, that in English, but the legi improbidaggi, which is a law against, um, essentially a law that was sought to control mayors uh, and their wrongdoing. And that's under review in Congress. And to me, that is, um, you know, a clear sign of the, you know, resurgence of the Centro, uh, which has drawn so much of its power from both the local level and then the state level and finally the federal level. Uh, and so a lot of these laws are being walked back uh, in ways that I think fit into the story of the equilibrium that I, I'm trying to say uh, exists. And, you know, this is not to say that change can't happen, but that change that does happen oftentimes gets reabsorbed. It gets, um, and so Lava Jato actually may have been responsible in some ways for putting the kibosh on 25 years of reforms that were building towards greater control, but then um, kind of got pushed back um, as the political system began to react. So I, there was so much there uh, that I can't address because we should hear from the audience who's been waiting patiently, but thank you both. Um, and, and it's really, there's a lot to chew on here. Thank you. So one of the questions we got from the audience um, talks about, you know, the incentives involved with the equilibrium um, and specifically asks, does the intervention of social media, uh, including in the 2018 election and since, uh, 
change these suboptimal incentives or deepen them. Um, and this is from uh, Mark Langevin, who's well known to us, a uh, consultant at Brazil Works. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Mark. I, you know, I, this is a book that's written uh, at 20,000 feet. It's not at 30,000 feet where I think Leslie would like it to be, but it's also not, uh, it's not where Sarah spends a lot of her time, I think, you know, dealing with individual politicians and their personal quirks and things like that. And I, you know, it's hard to disassociate social media from Bolsonaro. And I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but certainly, you know, there have been a lot of changes. I mean, we could think about all sorts of external changes that may impact this equilibrium. You talk about social media, uh, fintech might change the predominance of financial institutions. You know, I think that there are changing ways in which Bolsonaro is altering how you do presidential politics, not always for the better, but it, it is changing it. Um, there are external factors like how um, other countries enforce corruption across borders that are changing the way that this works. Um, certainly, you know, globalization, there are all of these external factors uh, but the book is really trying to understand why it is that both the changes that were created by the system, the political system, uh, and changes that come from abroad or from outside of the political system uh, have nonetheless kind of reverted, as, as Leslie said, to the mean, I would say, reverted to the equilibrium. Um, and uh, I don't see that social media changes much as, except for you know, perhaps the speed of politics. Um, and, you know, it may change a little bit on the margin who gets elected to Congress. We've seen some very, um, you know, interesting new politicians coming to the fore. Uh, but if you look at the 2022 elections right now, um, they don't look very different. You know, the, the, the potential candidates don't look very different from what we've seen in the coalitional presidential system for the past 25, 30, 35 years. Uh, with the possible exception of Luciano Huki. And, uh, you know, <laughs> aside from that, um, these, the, there is not um, somebody who seems like a break from uh, the way the system has worked. And we have another question. This one comes from Michelle Egan at American University. Um, and she asks, how much of the developmental state is federal and how much is decentralized? That's great. Michelle, I'm uh, one wall away from your office here. So um, <laughs> it's, it, this is nepotism at work, I guess. Um, but uh, thank you for the question. I think um, most of the developmental state, I would say, is federal. And my book is only about the federal system. Uh, but that, that said, states often have many uh, developmental states of their own. And different states have managed um, different degrees of separation from these developmentalist uh, policies and institutions. But um, I think that perhaps the most important change that happened, and, and this was a very significant one, happened in the 1990s, the late 1990s, when uh, state governments were essentially coerced into giving up their state banks. So this here the use of state becomes complex, but states like Sao Paulo and Rio were essentially forced to sell off their state-owned banks, uh, Banestado, Banerje, things like that. And uh, this, I think, limited some of the tools of the developmental state that were available to state governments. Um, but um, but they, they face some of the same problems and sometimes even worse problems uh, with the fiscal accounts uh, that, uh, you know, respond to politics uh, in a similar fashion. And I would say that the, in the same way that there's coalitional presidentialism at the federal level, there's coalitional gubernatorialism at the state level, where state assemblies are oftentimes, um, you know, become beholden to the governor of the day, even though they don't share all of the ideological uh, commitments of, of the governor. They don't share the partisan affiliation of, of the governor. So, so there are parallels, but there are important differences as well. Right. Um, and another question, and I think this one would be great to hear um, from Matthew, as also from Sarah, 
um, and Leslie is on the tension between um, kind of short-term incentives and long-term incentives when you're thinking about economic development in Brazil and you know the equilibrium that you describe in your book, right, which is kind of resistant to some of these more fundamental reforms um, that in the long run you would think um, would hold, hold interest. So why don't I kick it off just with a quick statement and then I really do think it would be great to hear from Sarah and Leslie, but my sense is that there is a lot of, um, over the years, there has been an awful lot of crisis driven economic management, policy management. Um, and this in fact, in some ways reinforces the incentives that are work are, are at work. And so, you know, the example that comes to mind is Cardozo and automotive policy. Uh, the Cardozo administration had its share of neoliberals, uh, but as soon as it was forced kind of backed against a wall by international crises, um, and balance of payments problems and, and so forth, it became more susceptible, I would say, to pressure from firms looking for the use of the toolkit of developmentalism. And, um, you know, tax incentives, um, credit, and so forth. So in, I, I think that there is a real trade-off here between short-term policy objectives and the possibilities of long-term strategic thinking and sticking to a strategic plan. Um, why don't I turn it over to the two of you? <laughs> Sarah, do you wanna jump in and then let's- Yeah, in? sure. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, is a story that I wrote about, about Bolsa Familia, but within the kind of larger context of how um, a government transfers work here in Brazil. And it was just really illuminating for me. Um, I think actually uh, Matthew's book cites this, this same report that I read from the economy ministry or the treasury, the treasury department, I think in, in 2019, showing you know, the breakdown of, of how um, government transfers kind of where they end up um, and, you know, what sticks out is that um, a lot of, of money is going to not necessarily the poorest people, uh, the poor do get, you know, there is a kind of a robust uh, system of transfers for the poor, but much more is going to kind of middle and upper class people through pensions. Um, and, and, you know, what ends up going to Bolsa Familia is just this tiny little fraction of the budget. And also, if you kind of take an even wider look um, and compare the amount that's going to, you know, pensions and other benefits for for workers, especially the the older they get, versus what goes to education and things that you know would go to forming the the human capital that would um, transform Brazil into, you know, into a more productive and, and lucrative state. Um, it's pretty clear to me that right now uh, Brazil is still very much thinking on the on the short term. And I guess the second thing I would say is I wonder, you know, I wonder if that's going to change as the, the demographic situation changes. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of Brazilians are getting older. Um, you know, the fiscal situation is really, really, really dire. Um, and, you know, obviously right now that the feeling among workers is to sort of get grab as much as they can so that when when they get to the old age, you know, there's still something in the pot left. But I do wonder as, you know, as the population gets younger, whether people will start thinking, you know, less about themselves and more about their children. And I guess that is that is the hope, but we'll see. Uh, Leslie? Yeah, so, well, be careful what you wish for. Um, yes, it would be good to get out of a semi-functional equilibrium, but, but it could be worse. And given that Bolsonaro is still quite popular and you know wants to be the, the Trump of the tropics and is bringing new social groups that aren't even in your book or even in you know, most of our consciousness until recently, you know, evangelicals and, and outright racists and xenophobes and, and so on and so on. Uh, I'm rather grateful for the bulwark of uh, policy continuance of 
uh, resoluteness as opposed to, to decisiveness. Um, so yes, it's good to think about long-term plans. It's good to think about political reform in order to talk about what those long-term plans should be. But um, I think we should be somewhat grateful in these days for a certain amount of the stability. I guess cautionary, <laughs> cautionary words there. Um, I think we have time for uh, one more question perhaps. Um, so this one is um, the Brazilian state uh, exists largely for its own benefit. Um, are there examples of outside forces? And, and we've talked about this a little bit, but um, to ask more specifically, are we seeing influence from you know, the private sector or civil society that's trying to change um, the way the Brazilian state engages in policymaking, you know, the processes of it in a way that could help get out of this current conundrum. I feel like Sarah would be, uh, she's got her finger on current events better than anybody here, uh, if you want to take. Yeah. Um... I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. All, the answer is always yes. But, um, but how, you know, how kind of much leverage and power and, and um, you know, support is, is, I guess, the important question. And, and so, I mean, there, someone mentioned earlier that there, um, you know, there are some exciting kind of new, younger, new politicians in, in Congress. And I guess that's sort of within the, within the political system. Um, and, you know, on, on the Amazon, I'm, I'm working right now on, on, on a story that tries to sort of understand the way that um, in the absence of, of the government sort of realizing what it needs to do or being willing to do what it needs to do uh, in the Amazon, the, the private sector is, is, you know, slowly, incrementally, hyperactively, incrementally uh, starting to, to, to move and, and, and try to um, you know, possibly even with the new Biden administration, um, work toward some sort of a solution or, or, or pressuring the, the Brazilian government uh, in a way that could result in, in, in positive change. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess, uh, yes, but I also think, I mean, I guess we haven't talked that much about the pandemic, but I think in the, in the kind of short term, um, the pandemic has also sort of clamped down on that. Um, I think you know, in a, in a normal uh, a normal year last year, you would have seen people in the streets. Brazilians would have protested at, at you know various times, but um, obviously COVID makes that a lot trickier. Um, and so I, I I mean I do wonder kind of once vaccination takes off more whether we will see kind of social unrest in, in a way um, or you know and how that might shape out. Thank you. Um, I would love to just know our final thoughts from our three panelists on, you know, what is the, the path forward, I guess. It's a hard one to ask. Um, but if Brazil is in this situation, right, where the incentives um, suggest that we're not going to see fundamental economic reforms or fundamental changes that will, will push the country forward, you know, how do we make that happen? You know, how do we change the incentives? Um, or do we just expect to continue to see, you know, another 10, 20 years of what has been happening since the return to democracy? Easy question. <laughs> Would either of you like to try it or I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up if you'd like. Yeah. Okay, Leslie? I'll start. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to switch the... Um, to, from 30,000 to 50,000 feet. But honestly, um, I think a lot about international politics and international relations. And um, I think Latin America, particularly South America, is in a situation where its uh, relationship with the rest of the world is shifting. I mean, I look at the international system. Um, Latin America is coming out of the Cold War and a system in which the United States was the, you know, the hegemon regional um, by any measure. 
to a situation where that is not so much the case anymore. And what does that mean? I don't think people have really thought enough about that. Um, for most of the large countries of South America, China is now the major trader, trading partner. Um, and the 21st century is going to be some combination of bipolar and multipolar. That is, it's not going to be bipolar with two really strong powers and nobody else that can challenge either of them. It's going to be bipolar in a situation where there are other major powers or great powers. The EU, if it can stick together and act collectively on a number of international issues, economically, it, it seems to be able to, maybe even more so since Brexit. Um, and rising powers like India. So my sense is that the way forward for Brazil, and I don't know exactly how this happens, um, but I actually think the way forward for Brazil is to pay more attention to its region. And I realize I'm putting an even more difficult problem forward, but I suspect that there's something good to come out of crisis, which is new thinking and maybe new willingness. And I will um, stop there for now. But I mean, that's what I'm writing about right now. I can, I can just say something really quickly, which is um, that, uh, I mean, I mentioned earlier the sort of nascent efforts to promote renewal in politics. And it, and it is sort of striking for me as a, um, you know, I'm 28 years old and I, um, you know, I know so many brilliant Brazilians in so many different walks of life from, um, from journalists to people in economics and, and cultural realms and human rights. And, um, and of course there are, uh, you know, a small, a small group of, of really devoted uh, young politicians as well. But I would say that, um, you know, that, that you don't see the kind of most uh, motivated and, and brilliant minds uh, going into politics for, for lots of reasons. Um, but, you know, ones that might uh, have to do with kind of a disillusionment uh, with the way that it all works, but also with kind of structural factors. And, how to, how to sort of solve that problem is really, really tricky. And um, I mean, it, it probably isn't just a federal thing. It's, it's something that, you know, has to be ground up as well. And I guess, um, you know, I hope that people write to me after me saying this and, and tell me about everything that is happening because I'm sure that there are things that are happening, um, but I hope to see, you know, to see those grow and, and start to make kind of big changes in the way that we've, we've just started to see recently. That's, that's a really interesting um, way of looking at it. I think, uh, you know, there are a number of ideas out there for how change could and should happen. Uh, the book really focuses, uh, as Sarah brought it out, on this hyperactive incrementalism. And I think that, that that is not a bad change strategy, partly because of what Leslie said about be careful what you wish for. You know, big bang change is not always a good thing. Um, but there are people out there, including uh, Sergio Abranches, for example, who came up with the idea that the concept of coalitional presidentialism, who are advocating for a new constitutional convention that Brazil just needs to remake its political system. Um, you know, I, I, ultimately, Brazilians will decide. But I think the lesson that comes out in the book um, that I come to is that it's very hard to change economic policy without a change in the political system. And um, how that change, what that change looks like has to be a Brazilian decision, but it may come about either through incrementalism, it could come about through a deliberate effort like Abranches is suggesting a constituent uh, con constitutional convention, but it could also come about because Brazil is forced up against the wall by any number of different crises that could face any country. Uh, but we've talked about the pandemic, um, the, the possibility of a fiscal crisis, particularly one that happens beginning at the state level and then arises to the federal level. Uh, those are, you know, 
there are any number of potential crises, and I don't like to think about that. But uh, in the past, Brazil has done well responding to crisis, and that's when some of the most significant changes have happened. Remember, for example, that the fiscal responsibility law was approved in time of crisis. So uh, I know we need to wrap up, but um, uh, ultimately, I think that change, when it comes, has to come first in the political realm. Uh, let me just wrap up my talk by saying thank you, three, all three of you, for what, a, what has been a really interesting uh, panel, and I hope the beginning of a longer term discussion. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Uh, and thank you, Sarah and Leslie, as well, for joining us. It's been a real privilege to have all of you with us and, and to kind of close out uh, the book that Matthew began when he was a fellow um, by having him and the two of you back at the Brazil Institute for this discussion. Um, so thank you all. And for those of you who are interested in Matthew's book, you can find more information on our website, uh, website wilsoncenter.org. Thank you all. <laughs>